Welcome to St. Therese. Um, uh, beautiful to see uh, so many guests, nice to have a packed house, and wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Uh, I'd like to introduce a few new faces to St. Therese. Uh, we'll start off, I'd like to introduce to you the, uh, the current student class. So if I could ask all of the new students, check this out. Look at this. All of our new staff. <laughs> wonderful. We have 23 students this year from all across Canada. One from, one neighbor from the south, Wisconsin, Catherine here, and one from the other side of the planet, all the way from the Philippines, Daryl. So God has blessed us indeed. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome back all of the St. Tres alumni. So good to see you guys. Wonderful to have you back. And of course, our dear friends from Bruno. Good to have you here. Uh, another face that is uh, new here at St. Tres this year is... Dr. Robert Stackpole. As God is continuing to build the house here at St. Therese, uh, he sent Robert to help with the nine-month faith formation program. Um, Robert is also the director, as well as most importantly being staff at St. Therese. Uh, he's also the director of the John Paul II Institute of Divine Mercy out of Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He's continuing that work as well, and it's a beautiful compliment to the work that's happening here at St. Therese. So, Robert... Formally welcome. Uh, and also a welcome back to Father Terry Donahue. This is Father. <laughs> this is Father Terry's seventh visit to St. Therese. So, as we were saying to the students in class, we're praying for covenant blessing on this journey <laughs> and trusting as we enter into the year of faith that indeed it will be a time of deep blessing. Uh, so we're very blessed to have Father Terry with us. Father Terry Donahue is with the religious community of the Companions of the Cross, a community of priests uh, based in Ottawa, where Father Terry is the director of lay formation and the chaplain to the lay associates of the Companions of the Cross. Um, and we're very, very blessed to have him with us this week, where the students have been going through the Keys for Growth in the Spiritual Life uh, seminar. And there's some nodding of heads from some of the folks that have been through that before. Uh, always a very fruitful time, building and set, establishing the foundation upon which our students will build uh, their spiritual life uh, for the rest of the nine months. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Father Terry, and we will explore the resurrection of Jesus. Historical fact or hysterical fiction? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome and for the full house. This is awesome. Great to see familiar faces in the crowd. I feel like I'm among friends. So that's a great blessing. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise and adore you for your goodness to us, for how you bless us in our creating us out of love, in giving us a plan and a purpose in your kingdom. And we ask for you to send your spirit of truth into our minds and your spirit of love into our hearts. Make us strong and loving and wise through, as we encounter you in the scriptures and we come to seek out the truth about the resurrection of your son who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. All right, so we've got a, a bit of a double-header talk today because I'm going to be covering two related topics. Now, the first one is going to be, where was Jesus crucified and buried? And then the second one will be, the resurrection of Jesus, historical fact or hysterical fiction. So this first one is going to be uh, kind of a crime scene investigation, except instead of a who done it, it's a where done it, which you probably have never had before. So let's kind of uh, uh, dig right in. Actually, before I go, whoops, I'm going too fast. There we go. Before I dive into the slides, on your handouts, I've given you the scriptural evidence for where Jesus was crucified and buried. And I'm not going to read to you all of the scriptures there. I bolded some key points that show us 
And I'm going to summarize all of this, uh, quoting actually a friend of, a, uh, a brother of mine in my community, Father Rick Jaworski, our resident scripture scholar who did a, uh, a paper on this at the Pontifical uh, Biblical Institute in Rome. And his conclusion after looking at all this scriptural evidence to describe what the Bible says about where Jesus was crucified and buried is this. Putting the pieces together, Jesus was crucified outside the gate near the city at a place called the Skull, Golgotha in Hebrew, uh, Cranion in Greek, which, from which we get the word uh, cranium, and Calvaria in Latin. Afterwards, he was laid out on the right-hand side in a new tomb in a nearby garden. It was possible to sit where Jesus' head and feet had been. This tomb was hewn out of rock, and a large stone was used to block the entrance. The tomb belonged to Joseph, a rich, prominent member of the council, who was from the Jewish town of Arimathea, at whose initiative Pilate had released Jesus' body. So this is about as much as we can glean from the scriptures. But there's a couple other minor points we can glean. One is the fact that passers-by must have been able to speak to Jesus on the cross. We have two instances of this in Mark and Matthew. And this supports the idea of a location near a path or a road, if they're walking by and able to yell things out. Uh, Apparently, the road that leads into the city from the countryside, because Simon the Cyrenian is a passerby coming in from the field. So that gives us a little bit more of a a geography. And this is based on uh, Raymond Brown's The Death of the Messiah. Now, if we move further from the scriptures to the culture of the Jews and the Romans, we learn that Jewish burials were often made outside of the city gates because they couldn't be buried inside of the city. And so the burial site being outside the city gates would be uh, pretty necessary. And the Romans crucified criminals by crowded roads really intentionally as an intimidation factor, right? Probably not a lot more intimidating than seeing someone hanging on a crucifix on a cross somewhere uh, as you're walking into a city. I don't think we could imagine the horror if that were to happen you know, in a city we lived in. You know, that would be probably one of the most gruesome things we would ever encounter. But this was, re- this, this was a common occurrence going into cities that were under Roman rule. So I don't know how petrified you would be of the Romans, but I would be pretty shaken in my boots at that point, right? <laughs> um, so. Plautus uh, indicated that one, the one who carried the cross beam for their cross would then perish outside the gate. So we actually have non-biblical evidence of this outside the gate um, crucifixion location. So let's move on to the archaeological evidence. Jerusalem has a lot of walls, several walls, in fact, on the northern side, more than one. And if we look at a picture of Jerusalem as it would have looked in 30 AD, We can see that we have uh, a set of walls that are the south wall, which is more uh, a modern wall. Then we have gates here. The dung gate is here, the gate of the potsherds. The fountain gate over here. There's a water gate over here. There's a temple in the court of the Gentiles, uh, different walls around the temple. But then there was two north walls. There was the first north wall, and then there's what's called the second north wall uh, to the north of Jerusalem. And the reason for having multiple walls on the north was because there was risk of uh, invasion, so defense, and also to expand. You expand the city walls while you leave the the first wall up, right? You know, belt and suspenders, right? (laughs) And, uh, And you keep on building extra walls as the city is expanded. So actually what we can find from the archaeological and historical evidence is that uh, the first wall was from the reign of Alexander uh, Janaeus in the first century BC, early in that century. And then the second wall, which is the blue wall here, was built by King Herod at some point during his reign from 37 to 4 BC. And then we actually have a third wall that was built after the time of Christ. And this was built, um, this was built by Herod Agrippa I, 
probably around 44 AD and was finished by others before the Roman invasion that happened in 66 to 70 AD that ended in the destruction of Jerusalem. So if the scriptures and tradition are to be verified, then Golgotha should be outside of the second wall because that was already built, right? Definitely outside of the first wall, but it shouldn't be outside necessarily of the third wall, right? Because that was built after Jesus' death and burial. So the problem with figuring out the gate is we got a lot of gates going on, don't we? Right? I just showed you a bunch of them. So which gate is a good candidate for the outside the gates location? Well, it just so happens that one of these gates is called a garden gate. Right there. Why is this interesting? The Gospel of John indicates that Christ's tomb was in a garden. Very likely, Jesus was crucified and buried north of Jerusalem because a major junction in the north wall of the city, where the eastern section of it swung farther to the north, so you can see this uh, north wall kind of goes up and swings over, so it's taller up here and lower down here, there is um, a name connected with the garden gate, and this was based on the Hebrew gan, or the Aramaic gana, which meant garden. So the name of the gate meant garden in the language of the people. And it was one of the four gates in the north wall. And a pretty obvious reason for naming a gate like that was that there were gardens in this northern area. A gate that went out to the garden. So uh, Krauss indicates that it was not uncommon for Jews to, to put to rest their dead in fields or gardens, particularly when they were planning to collect the bones later for reburial in an ossuary, which was a common practice of the time. Um, so oftentimes, we even see in uh, Jewish writings, a garden and a graveyard are in close proximity. So the traditional site of Golgotha, where the earliest Christians uh, spent time uh, and went to, was just north of the city of Jerusalem, just outside the ga garden gate, near the, north, the second north wall, the second wall. Right from the time of Jesus' death, there had been a tradition of Christians going to a certain site where these events were said to have taken place. And until they fled in Jerusalem before the Roman siege, the Jerusalem church held liturgical celebrations at that site to basically go out there and celebrate the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, this went on, uh, for a time until, uh, or actually before I show you that, I will show you this would be uh, the likely reconstruction of the second wall location where Calvary was and then where the tomb of Christ would have been, all in very close proximity to each other. And the reason for this close proximity is actually indicated in what we know about the location of the tomb, that the tomb, um, the tomb was nearby, it says in John 19. So the tomb is near to where the crucifixion occurred. It was a Jewish day of preparation. This is a close-by tomb. Let's get the burial done quickly because it's close by. They laid Jesus there. So given this uh, configuration, you might think, well, it would be easy you know, for the Christians to preserve the location, you know, they're continuing to go there on and on. But there was a problem. And the problem was the Emperor Hadrian filled in the quarry of the Calvary area to provide a level base for, guess what, his new temple. This was a reconstruction of uh, a Roman city in the place of Jerusalem after the destruction of Jerusalem and, and various other revolts that occurred. So what happened was... Uh, he was building the Roman city of Aelia Capitolina, and he filled the quarry to provide a base for his temple to Aphrodite, or perhaps to Jupiter. There's somewhat conflicting accounts on exactly which uh, Roman gods uh, and Greek gods were, were worshipped there. So the account, according to St. Jerome, is Golgotha protruded above this platform that he created, 
and constituted a base for a statue of Aphrodite. Christians are probably not too happy about this, right? <laughs> this is a pretty big slap in the face to, <laughs> to Christians. Now, whether this was an intentional slap in the face or, or not, it was certainly something uh, that kind of was an affront to Christianity. But it also happened to be an excellent marker for finding the site afterwards, a clear marker for the location of Calvary and the tomb of Christ. And so essentially what we have afterwards is when Constantine decided, uh, after his conversion to Christianity, decided to build a church commemorating the resurrection, we're moving up to 326, 325 AD, Christian tradition said that the tomb was under Hadrian's temple. So instead of building a church in a very nice open area that would be you know, somewhat nearby, what did he do? He started digging. He started digging or having his people dig. Obviously, he wouldn't dig himself probably. But he had a team of people dig to find Calvary and the tomb of Christ. And this is the account according to Eusebius, the bishop of Caesarea, in his life of Constantine. As layer after layer of the subsoil came into view, the venerable and most holy memorial of the Savior's resurrection, beyond all our hopes, came into view. And so this led to a building of a basilica around both Mount Calvary and the tomb of Christ. Calvary turned into Mount Calvary when Constantine ordered that all of the rock that's in that shaded area be removed so that he could have a flat foundation to build his basilica. This was a huge, huge task. And the difficulty of this task is actually evidence for this being the site that at least Christians believed was the site of Christ's burial and Christ's crucifixion. Because if Constantine wasn't sure, if it was just kind of a guess, you think he would have bothered to do this? Probably not. He would have just built it somewhere nearby that was flat. And there was, there was a big flat field right nearby. So this is, is strong evidence, this amount of work is strong evidence that this spot is the spot according to the best uh, research that Constantine could have done to find where Christ died and where he was buried. So we see actually here that there, is actually, there are actually sets of uh, rooms in here leading to an inner, there's kind of an outer vestibule uh, with doors leading into a burial chamber. So this uh, basilica looks like, looked like this in 335 AD when it was completed. We see on this side is the tomb of Christ that is underneath a rotunda. So the two rooms, two of those three rooms, are actually in a, uh, underneath a large dome at the, uh, the center uh, of the church. And then a little off center is the Mount Calvary, where this cross symbol is. And if we zoom in, we actually can see how close they are to each other, and the rest of the church was used for, uh, for worship. The name Mount arose only in the fourth century when the surrounding rock was removed. So before that, you don't really call it Mount Calvary, but after all that rock was removed, it looked like a little uh, mount. And another piece of evidence that supports this is Cyril of Jerusalem in 350 AD reported that the remains of a garden that had previously existed were still visible next to this basilica. So the area was clearly a garden or had evidence of being a garden uh, at that time. So this particular basilica underwent major renovations over the next 15 or 16 centuries, and now looks, uh, oh, okay. This is the, what the tomb of Christ would have looked like. This is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like at the site of uh, underneath the sepulcher. 
So you have a little vestibule area, and then they built all of this around it because it was now in a church. So what you're going to see in the next slides are, are, are the actual church of the Holy Sepulcher, which is the remaining piece of the Constantine's Basilica with big portions removed and then remodeled and reworked. But the same essential structure of foundations is there. And you can go there. I've never been to the Holy Land. Who's been to the Holy Land? Great. Have you gone to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? So then you would recognize this as being the place where the Rock of Calvary is located. If you see, just underneath this plexiglass structure or glass is, uh, is actual rock. And there's a little place in here which you can... Uh, so there's a huge altar just above... Uh, the place where it is believed that Christ was crucified. And on the left, you can see the rock with the light up here. It's a person going in here because there's a place where you can actually reach down, right, and, and touch the rock. And this is on uh, the other side. Nearby that, in the same holy sepulcher, is the modern-day uh, holy sepulcher underneath this ro large rotunda. And so this is an example of one of the, probably at, at Easter, uh, one of the liturgical celebrations that occurs there. I have a question. Yes. What exactly does Sepulchre stand for? I think it's uh, just a, kind of a different word for, for a tomb. So the holy tomb. It may have some other connotations as well, but... So, that's the best answer that we have to where was Jesus buried and where did he die? Is it 100% certain that this is the exact spot? No, but uh, with historical research like this, you're not going to find 100% certainty about uh, much of anything. <laughs> so, this is a very, very solid case that really isn't disputed. There's not really any credible uh, archaeological or historical explanation for any other location uh, that contradicts this account. So let's move on to the resurrection of Jesus uh, and what happened in that tomb. Is it reasonable to believe that Jesus rose from the dead? In historical studies, it is not uh, really crucial for the historian to believe or not believe in something. Um, what's crucial is what we can demonstrate, what we can give evidence for and what we can prove. So to quote uh, Daniel Caffey in A Few Good Men, it doesn't matter what I believe, it only matters what I can prove in history. <laughs> so <laughs> historical arguments, however, can't really arrive at absolute certainty. A position is demonstrated when the reasons for accepting it significantly outweigh the reasons for not accepting it. This leaves a large gray area where positions are held to be likely or probable. A finding of historicity is essentially a default position, meaning we have no other reasonable way to account for the presence of this story in the text or the presence of this evidence. So the fact that we can't prove with 100% absolute certainty Christianity is not really a problem because no other religion can do that either for the same reasons. So we don't need to search for historical certainty about these events, but we look for strength of probability. In other words, is this event very doubtful or is it very certain? How plausible is this event? Can we determine that an event is more probable of happening than not? So that's what we're going to be doing in this historical approach. And what the approach I'm going to be taking is based on an approach that was used by Gary Habermas and Michael R. Lacona in the book, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. And they use uh, various historical principles at the beginning of this text. And also I'll be using The Resurrection of Jesus, which is a printing of a revised version of a PhD thesis by Michael Lacona on this topic. So nice 717 pages here for your perusal. <laughs> kind of intimidating, yes. But the beginning of this uh, PhD thesis, he looks at the guidelines that are used by, by historians in general in assessing testimony, all these accounts of past events. And he comes up with 
five criteria that are used to determine how certain are we of an event, how plausible is an event. The first one is we're looking for multiple independent sources. If we only have one source, that's not really strong evidence for much of anything because one person could get it wrong. But if two independent people are getting the same story straight in the essence of it, then that's evidence that that really occurred in history, especially if they are truly independent and the more of them you have, the better. Another one is enemy attestation. This means that the source doesn't sympathize with the message. He's been an enemy of the message. He didn't believe the message at some point but then came to believe in it, or is admitting it even when he still doesn't like it, <laughs> or when he's persecuting those who are promoting the message. The opposite would be, you know, attestation which where you're going to get a lot of profit from the event, right? That would be uh, evidence of possibly you're saying this for a profit motive. Another thing we're looking for are embarrassing admonitions. So the source is, is not really expected to create a story and make up a story that makes it look bad, right? If I'm going to create up some, make up some lie, it's going to be a, a, a nice lie, right? <laughs> An attractive lie. A lie that makes me famous and makes me look awesome. So an embarrassing admonition, it's not proof, but it's another piece of evidence adding to the weight of plausibility. Eyewitness testimony. Primary accounts are usually stronger than secondhand accounts and especially if you have multiple primary accounts. And the earlier the testimony is, the better. The less time between an event and the account, the more reliable the witness is considered to be. So from this, Lacona and his co-authors used what he, they called a minimal facts approach. And this means we're going to take evidence that has a really high degree of certainty. We're only going to kind of limit ourselves to facts that we can determine from data that are really strongly evidenced and that almost every scholar who studies that subject, even the skeptical ones, will admit that's, that's true. This is a fact of history. And we're going to create a historical bedrock to start with and then see what hypotheses can explain those minimal facts. And the advantage of this is that it avoids debates over other issues. We don't have to, for instance, demonstrate that the entire Bible is inerrant, you know, from cover to cover, before we start to demonstrate the resurrection is, is, is true. So we can just focus on, well, maybe the rest of the Bible is full of, you know, <laughs> full of errors. But if these facts are historically accurate, how do we explain those? and if the resurrection is the best explanation for that minimal set of facts, then that's the argument. So the four facts that we're going to use in this explanation are the following. First, that Jesus was crucified and buried. Secondly, that early Christians believed that Jesus rose from the dead and believed that he appeared to them. Thirdly, that Paul suddenly changed from being a persecutor of the church to a preacher of Christianity. And fourthly, and this one is a little bit uh, not as secure as the first three in terms of how many historians accept it, but we're going to look at was Jesus' tomb found empty? So virtually all historians accept the first three, and the fourth, we'd say maybe 75% will accept the fourth, including skeptics. So what is the best explanation of these four facts is really the, the basic argument. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, is there a natural explanation to explain all of these facts? So let's start with number one, death by crucifixion. There are multiple early attest, independent attestations of this. All four Gospels report the death of Jesus by crucifixion, and there are many letters of the New Testament that report it including Paul's reports in 1 Corinthians and Galatians. And these are early. They're actually earlier than the Gospels because those were written no later than 55 AD. And at one point, Paul notes in 1 Corinthians 15 that he had preached on the death earlier to Corinth in 51 AD. So that's only 20 years after the death of Christ. That's not a long time. That's actually very short in, when it comes to attestations of an event. So there are also extra-biblical sources, which we can look at. Josephus, 
wrote in his Antiquities of the Jews, when Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the high standing, highest standing among us, had condemned him to be crucified. So he is giving an account in which he states that Jesus had been condemned by Pilate to be crucified. <laughs> Tacitus speaks of Nero fastening the guilt of burning Rome on Christians. And Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. Lucian of Samosata says that the Christians you know worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rites. Mara Bar Serapion has the question, what advantage came to the Jews by the murder of their wise king, seeing that from the very, that very time their kingdom was driven away from them? Now you'll notice that some of these are a bit later, mid-2nd century, mid-2nd century. Others are 115 AD, um, and you know, so we're looking at things that are happening up to 100 or 120 years after the event. And we even have in the Talmud, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged. Now, Yeshu is Joshua in Hebrew, which is Jesus in Greek, or Jesus, and hanging on a tree meant crucifixion. We even see this in Galatians 3, cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree, Christ having become a curse for us, and that refers to the crucifixion. Now, some of these sources that I've just quoted to you, some historians will say, well, I don't agree with this source. So not all six of these sources that are extra biblical are these rock solid, 100% of theologians or historians agree that that's a valid source. Some of them are questioned in different ways. But even if you question all of those, um, the, the account of Josephus in particular uh, has strong evidence that this is an independent account, independent of all of the gospels, uh, and that it's evidence for at least Jesus' death. So there is no ancient evidence to the contrary. There is no ancient source that says Jesus did not die or, you know, in, by crucifixion, that there was something else that happened. Another point for Jesus' death by crucifixion is that if someone is crucified, it's very hard to survive it. Now, this seems kind of obvious, but it really needs to be stated. There's only one account of a person surviving crucifixion after receiving Rome's best possible medical care at the time. So uh, Jesus was also scourged beforehand, so his chances of survival were even worse than someone. And uh, odds are he wasn't going to get the best medical care Rome could offer um, if he had survived it. There's no evidence that Jesus survived his crucifixion. And survival wouldn't actually explain belief in Jesus' resurrection, so it's not really a good argument to put forward. Uh, the liberal scholar David Strauss noted, uh, imagine Jesus half dead in the tomb, wakes up in the dark, and wants to get out. <laughs> so he takes his hands, which have been pierced by nails, places them on an extremely heavy stone, pushes it out of the way. He's met by guards who say, where do you think you're going, pal? And he says, I'm out of here, guys. And then he beats them up. And then he walks perhaps miles on pierced and wounded feet in order to finally find his disciples. Finally, he finds where they're at. Knock, knock, knock. Peter opens the door, sees Jesus hunched over in this pathetic, mutilated state, and he says, wow, I can't wait to have a resurrected body like yours. No, he probably would have said, let's get you a doctor. You need help. So the entire idea of the resurrection coming from this kind of a, a narrative is, is, just, is just kind of silly. So even the highly critical co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crossan, who denies a lot of pretty central teachings of um, uh, the historical accuracy of the Bible, wrote that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical could ever be. So he believes that th this is a historical, very certain event. So fact number two, Jesus, rose, Jesus' disciples believed he rose and appeared to them. And for this, we really have something interesting. 
The apostles wrote letters to their churches as early as 51 AD. So we're looking at early letters that are 20 years after the event. But these letters actually teach uh, the essentials of the Christian faith, even earlier than the Gospels. But they point to something that's even earlier than the letters. Because Paul quotes from creeds, from early Christian creeds, which existed long before he wrote the letters. And we see an example of one of these creeds in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8. For I deliver to you, as of first importance, what I also received. That Christ died for our sins, and in accordance with the scriptures, he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to, uh, to Kephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as well, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. The first part of this is clearly a creed that was used by early Christians and taught to St. Paul. We know this because for the structure of it, and also, I delivered to you what I also received. So he's saying that this formulation that I'm about to rattle off here didn't come from me. Obviously, it comes from him at the very end. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. That's obviously his, you know, putting himself in the story there. But the beginning part of this was something taught to him sometime after his conversion. Paul's conversion was probably within three years of the death of Christ. And then he delivered this to the Corinthians when he visited Corinth in 51 AD. So the use of Cephas and four times a particular Greek uh, participle uh, or particle, hoti, indicates that this creed was likely first composed in Aramaic, that this wasn't a Greek creed. It was written, it was spoken in the language of the people, of the language that Jesus spoke, uh, Aramaic. So this is Jewish Christian language, which pushes for an earlier dating, because Jewish Christians were more influential in the early period of Christianity. And many scholars believe that Paul received this creed when he visited Peter and James in Jerusalem around 35 AD, that that's really the most likely explanation of where he got this creed, because we read that he visited them in Galatians 1, 18 to 19. So if that, if that is the case, then that is about an early piece of evidence that the Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead, as you're going to get, within five years of his death. I mean, if that doesn't satisfy someone, there's no hope. <laughs> um, but the latest it could be would be 51 AD. Philippians 2.6 has a similar uh, type of creed. And... Pope Benedict XVI wrote, as early as 20 years or so after Jesus' death, the great Christ hymn of the letter to the Philippians offers a fully developed Christology stating that Jesus was equal to God, emptied himself, became a man, humbled himself to die on the cross, and that to him now belongs the worship of all creation, the adoration that God, through the prophet Isaiah, said was due to him alone. So the idea that Jesus being divine or that he rose from the dead was a late uh, addition to Christianity is really, historically speaking, uh, not credible. It's not a credible uh, assertion. Furthermore, the four Gospels and Acts add to multiple independent attestation. Each one of the Gospels accounts and Acts chapter 1 uh, account for the resurrection, even if Mark 16 is viewed as a later addition, because Mark predicts Jesus' resurrection five times. So just the fact that the addition doesn't have it, Mark's gospel does. So these, there are also seven early sources attesting to the disciples' willingness to suffer and die for their belief in the resurrection of Jesus. Both in Luke and Ignatius of Antioch, Clement of Rome, I, I won't quote all of these sources, Polycarp, Dionysius, Tertullian, Origen, these sources indicate that the disciples believed that Jesus rose from the dead. It's not proof of the resurrection itself, because, I mean, followers of almost every religion are um, willing to, um, you know, suffer for the sake of what they believe. That doesn't make all those religions right. 
But what it does show, voluntary suffering and acceptance of even death shows sincerity of belief. They sincerely believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what we're trying to show right here. They weren't liars making up a story for themselves or for their own interests. We have reports that he had, Jesus was raised from an eyewitness, Paul, and probably more, the Jerusalem apostles. And these reports are very early. They're multiple independent testimonies, and they're uh, testimony from one person who was hostile to the message, Paul, before he converted. So this type of evidence is very strong for the belief. Move on to Paul's conversion. He was a persecutor of Christianity. He arrested and beat and had Christians executed. Paul himself states this in many of his letters in the New Testament. But Luke confirms it also in the Acts of the Apostles. And there's also an extra biblical quote referring to Paul, saying, Paul, who persecuted the church, now proclaims the faith he once sought to destroy. So this is the kind of evidence, you know, from multiple independent sources that really is is great for historians. We're like, this is, this, is, this is good stuff. There are seven sources testifying to Paul's willingness to suffer and die for his belief. The similar ones that testified earlier about the other apostles. He was a believer in the resurrection of Jesus. Paula Fredrickson writes, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they believed they saw. That's what they say, and then all the historical evidence we have afterwards attest to their conviction that that's what they saw. I don't know what they saw, but I do know that as a historian, that they must have seen something, and that they believed that that was the risen Christ. So now we move on to the final fact, that Jesus' tomb was found empty. We see this in the uh, accounts from John, about Mary Magdalene and Peter and John going to the tomb. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb, saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Now, it would have been really impossible for Christianity to get off the ground if the body had still been in the tomb. Why is this? Because the Jewish authorities would have taken the tomb, gone to the tomb, shown the body, and basically said, look, stop believing in Jesus and this resurrection story, they would have done that immediately. In fact, there's evidence from the scriptures themselves that that's exactly, they had to come up with another story, a cover story, to explain why there was no body. And they wouldn't be coming up with cover stories if the body was there. And if the body was there, they also would have used it to try to nip Christianity in the bud because this was a real issue for the Jewish authorities at the time. They, were, they had conspired to have the Romans crucify Jesus, so they weren't going to stop trying to stop Christianity. That was really an important thing uh, for them to try to do. Furthermore, Justin Martyr and Tertullian report that members of the Jewish leadership were claiming that the disciples had stolen his body, and this is Matthew 28, as I just mentioned. So. This conviction that the sepulcher was empty was shared by Jews, uh, Jewish authorities, and w- by Christians. They, the Jewish authorities gave a natural explanation for it, and the Christians gave a supernatural one, that he was risen. So this means we actually have positive evidence in a hostile source. The hostile source are the Jewish authorities. They don't want to admit the tomb is empty, but it is, and they have to explain it. So this is solid gold when it comes to historical evidence. Another important thing is that the resurrection in Christianity is something very new. A lot of times we think, oh, well, you know, everybody knows what resurrection is. You know, it's because we're Christians. (laughs) And we think that resurrection is such a common idea, but it's actually very unique in its full understanding to Christianity. N.T. Wright, who wrote a book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, another 700 and something page wonder, had this to say about the belief in resurrection at the time of uh, the early Christians. 
It's truly remarkable that all the early Christians known to us, all of them, believed in a future bodily resurrection, that our bodies would rise again, even though most of them came from a pagan world where this was regarded as complete and utter rubbish. Pagans didn't have resurrection of the body. People in the ancient world were incredulous when faced with the Christian claim because they knew perfectly well that when people die, they stay dead. And that was the view of uh, other religions uh, of the day. So the resurrection in Christianity had clear, interesting new features in it. It happened in advance to Jesus Christ. That was a new thing. It's not just that everyone's going to be raised at the end of the world. It's that Jesus is risen right now, in advance. The Messiah has been raised. Secondly, the resurrection of Christ involved a transformation of the physical body so that he was immune to pain and death. That was really a new feature of the idea of a resurrection. That the resurrection is immediately connected with baptism, with holiness, with all these other core Christian doctrines. It's not just an add-on. It's right at the foundation of Christianity and the other core teachings. It's in the center, the focal point of the entire doctrinal framework. When someone like St. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is in vain. All of Christianity hinges on the resurrection. That's how central it is to Christianity. And resurrection was the only early Christian belief about what happens after death. There was no variety. Among the Jews, there was a lot of variety. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. The Pharisees did. They were debating it. Other people, well, this is the boat of Sheol, and what happens there, and what happens after? How much do they know? And there's all these different theories. With Christianity, there's only one theory. There's only one answer to the question, and that is unique and new. So all this forces us as historians to ask a really simple question. Why did all the early Christians known to us have the very new but remarkably unanimous view of resurrection? What caused that to happen? Of course, all the early Christians would say, we have this view of resurrection because Jesus rose from the dead. And that is why we believe all of this about resurrection. Uh, and if the idea of uh, that Jesus had been raised from the dead only started to crop up maybe 30 years after Christianity got started, if it was a late addition, well then, not all Christians would believe it, right? You'd have some that formed their beliefs before that got introduced and added in. So it must have happened, belief in the resurrection must have happened at the very beginning of Christianity to really explain why it was universally believed among all Christians. So the wide extent and the unanimity of early Christian belief in resurrection forces us to say something happened at the beginning of Christianity, way early on, that colored the whole Christian movement. So when every argument has been considered and weighed, the only conclusion acceptable to the historian must be that the women who set out to pay their last respects to Jesus found to their consternation not a body, but an empty tomb. And this is according to Beza Vermes, who is a professor of Jewish studies at Oxford University. So these are the four facts, that the tomb was found empty, that Paul's conversion to Christ, uh, conversion from persecutor to preacher occurred, that the Jesus disciples believed he rose and appeared to them, and that Jesus died by crucifixion. And you might think, well, you know, so what? We proved these four facts fairly certainly. You know, what's the big deal? Well, the case for the resurrection of Jesus is this. Jesus' resurrection explains all of these facts easily and without strain. These facts that are acknowledged by a large majority of scholars. The historical context exists where Jesus' resurrection is at home. This means, at least, that there's a reasonable basis to believe in the resurrection. If you believe that supernatural things could occur at all, then if there's a supernatural thing happening here, it looks like he rose from the dead, is the best explanation of what we have. So what we need to look for are, are there any plausible alternate theories that exist that could account for these facts? This is what we would call Occam's razor, where, like, well, let's find a simpler explanation than Jesus rising from the dead, because that requires 
God raising someone from the dead or you know, some intervention from a supernatural entity. So can we explain the historical bedrock using other natural explanations? That's really what we need to look at. So I'll just go through a few natural explanations that have been presented by others. The first one is a conspiracy theory. This is the earliest attempt to explain away the miracle, as I mentioned before. Uh, the Jewish authorities said, you are to say his disciples came by at night, stole him while we were asleep, and if this gets to the ears of the governor, uh, we'll satisfy him. So this is an initial story of a conspiracy to hide the body. So the argument here is that the disciples stole the body and formed a conspiracy to spread Jesus' teachings and deceive all the followers into thinking he was alive. This is a very deceptive and sophisticated hoax for ordinary Galilean Jews, first of all. But let's say they, they tried to pull it off. The big question is why? Why would the followers of Jesus make up this story? What would they have to gain? So basically, you know, it would look something like this. Hey, Peter. Yeah? Yeah, I'm John. I've got a great idea. Let's make up a story about Jesus being risen from the dead. I'm sure that we'll all get expelled from, from Jerusalem for it, and we'll lose our jobs, we'll lose our wealth, we'll lose any families we have, we'll lose our land. I think you're probably going to get subject to torture. You'll probably die of martyrdom. Uh, so who's with me? <laughs> you know, I don't really see that being a very compelling conspiracy theory. The answer is no one would be with the person who is trying to pull this off. And it's not a really a, a stretch for, for people to realize that that's, that that's what they would be signing up for. Uh, they were already hiding in the upper room, afraid of, for their lives. It wasn't like they were planning on uh, getting a lot of um, you know, bonus perks and uh, pats on the back for coming up with a resurrection story. And the fact is, people are not willing to die for a lie that they make up themselves. That's just um, complete insanity. Sure, maybe one person would do that, but you have to get all of the disciples to agree on this at once. <laughs> Otherwise, one of them is going to say, sorry, <laughs> that's not what happened. I was there. <laughs> so basically, all the people who uh, you know, were there would be able to uh, say yay or nay. So a large group of people agreeing and none break even under torture. No one, weak or strong, saint or sinner, Christian or heretic, has ever confessed freely or under pressure, bribe, or even torture that the whole story of the resurrection was a fake, a lie, a deliberate deception. Even when people did break under torture, that did happen. People were tortured, said, deny Christ and we'll stop torturing you. And said they deny Christ. They worshiped Caesar. But they never let that cat out of the bag that Jesus didn't rise from, that it was a hoax. Never revealed that the resurrection was their conspiracy because that cat was never in that bag. That's the best explanation for why it never happened. Voluntary suffering and death, acceptance of death shows sincerity. Uh, it shows they were sincere. So this uh, theory requires the disciples to be insincere. It's contrary to all the evidence of the Gospels which are considered reliable documents in these particular minimal facts that we've just uh, uh, stated. It also doesn't match the psychological state of the disciples after the crucifixion who were filled with fear and at the brink of despair and filled with unbelief, according to the accounts. So there's got to be some explanation for what transformed them from full of fear to full of courage. And this theory doesn't do that. The second one is an apparent death theory. This was often found in 18th and 19th century attempts at explaining away the resurrection. And it's used today by some Muslim apologists. And the argument here is simply that Jesus didn't die, that he was placed in an unconscious state by Joseph of Arimathea into the tomb. And the cool air and the darkness just so refreshing. It revived him. So this is uh, a real problem. Uh, first of all, the severity of Jesus' injuries is, is amazing. The scourging at the pillar, the repeated beatings, the crowning with thorns, the spear thrust into his side uh, after his death, 
uh, wrapped in burial cloth, 70 to 75 pounds, in addition to the spices, uh, all the problems of the conspiracy theory would have to apply as well. Because even if he survived, they'd have to hide him somewhere for months. So any story of a resurrection is a conspiracy. So we're back to all the problems with theory one. So let's move on to the wrong tomb theory. This is the most, uh, uh, oh, a theory where the most famous statement was uh, British scholars in Cursip and Lake in 1907. This is where the women and the disciples go to the wrong tomb, they find it empty, and conclude, well, he must have risen from the dead, because we can't find the body. Now, this ignores the fact, or, or discounts the fact that, or the evidence that the women take note precisely where the location of Jesus' tomb was to be found. And we have three different accounts of this in Luke, Matthew, and Mark in order to visit the same, the grave the next morning. The women tell the disciples that Jesus is risen and he's not in the tomb anymore. And what do you know? They amazingly run to the same wrong tomb independently and draw the same false conclusion. And of course, the Sanhedrin and all the Jews, Jewish authority get word of this, and they go to the wrong tomb as well. Because otherwise, they would have found the right one, and they would have shown the body, and end of game, end of story. If the Jewish authorities could have exposed the corpse of Jesus, they would have done so immediately. Finally, to really explain all this and make it consistent, you have to have the Roman centurions guarding the wrong tomb. The hallucination theory. This is a psychological explanation where the state of mind caused by the grief of the death of Jesus conjures up images of deceased loved ones. And we know that this is actually possible, that some people see images of deceased loved ones because of you know, serious grief. So the theory is disciples were hysterical and collectively hallucinated, saw the resurrected Jesus, and they were susceptible to a sustained collective state of hallucination uh, that is otherwise unprecedented because it's not just one person here. So one problem with this is I've even seen this on some skeptics' websites. It's kind of interesting. The idea of mass hallucinations. And uh, there's one website called Less Wrong. Have you ever heard of this website? It's basically by, by skeptics who are trying to have rigorous thought processes. And one of them started to get skeptical of the idea of mass hallucinations and asked on their forum, where is the solid evidence that mass hallucinations of this type, of the type that we think might have happened with Jesus and his resurrection, where is the evidence that these happen? And, and I, waited, I, I read all, all the responses on this forum. There were no responses that actually gave an answer to this question. So. I, I started to look for you know, evidence that this actually has happened. Give me a documented example of a mass hallucination of the type where everyone in a large group of people is seeing at different times maybe, or even at the same time, kind of the same kind of experience of someone coming back to life or something like that. So I, I, this is still an open question for me. I, I, if someone can find me a psychological journal that documents this, that would be helpful. But he, let's, let's give it the benefit of the doubt and say this is a psychological, you know, that it does happen sometimes. Well, people don't sustain these hallucinations over periods of weeks. And we're also not dealing with hysterical people but we're dealing with people in very different psychological states. We have humdrum Galilean fishermen. We have Mary Magdalene weeping. We have women who are afraid and astonished. We have Peter who's full of remorse and repentance. We have Thomas who is the resident skeptic, who is incredulous. Prove it to me, I don't, I don't believe it. And we have disciples who are discouraged and distracted or, or wandering off to Emmaus. We've got all these different types of people um, and none of these are likely to have the same hallucination because they're not all in the same psychological state, which at the very least would have to be present according to everything people claim about mass hallucinations. So if they were hallucinating, 
how would they get the Jewish unbelievers to participate in this hallucination as well? Why wouldn't they just produce the body and end it? So these, these kind of simpler natural explanations lead us to this kind of logical possibility uh, categorization. One idea is that he didn't die. So if your theory includes this as a natural explanation, it's, it's probably related to, somehow similar to, the swoon theory that we just covered. If you believe that Jesus did die in your natural explanation, then there are two possibilities. He didn't rise, and the apostles knew it. That would be some type of conspiracy theory, because the apostles are clearly going to be in on whatever the uh, conspiracy is, because they knew that he didn't rise. If, in your theory, we have the apostles didn't know they thought he rose from the dead, but they were sincerely wrong, then you're going to have something related to the hallucination or wrong tomb theory. Now, there are many variations of this that I haven't gotten into because there's only a, an hour to give the talk. If you want to look at the most modern uh, attempts at the apostles didn't know that he didn't rise, but they believed it, and they had some kind of a you know, uh, misunderstanding or you know, uh, legendary accounts and so on, I encourage you to actually pick up this book and read uh, Michael Lacona's analysis of four or five very recent attempts at giving a natural explanation and how he does a similar minimal facts approach to show how each of those theories, the most recent theories proposed by atheists, by skeptics, by uh, non-Christians, how those fail to explain these minimal facts and some other minimal facts that he has uh, in his document. And the key, the key thing to understand here is if there is, if you're gonna paint a historically responsible portrait of Jesus, you have to be able to explain the facts that are regarded as virtually indisputable. If a hypothesis fails to explain all of these bedrock facts, the historical bedrock, it is time to drag that hypothesis back to the drawing board. It is time to drag that out into the shed and shoot it. <laughs> because it doesn't account for things virtually everyone agrees are true. So this leads to a conclusion, the same conclusion that, that is in this book uh, for much more detailed cases and possibilities, that if those explanations don't account for the bedrock, then the only explanation that we have that does account for it in a reasonable way is that Jesus rose again. Logically, there aren't any other sort of alternatives, and that's called Christianity. This type of presentation has led people, including uh, Anthony Flew, who was an atheist at one time, but became a theist near the end of his life. He was a philosopher, a famous atheist, um, to say, and he's not, he's not a Christian, but he said the case for the Christian revelation is based on the resurrection of Jesus is a very strong one if you believe in any revelation at all. So this is a pretty big admission for someone who's not a Christian, who believes that God is out there and he's still trying to figure out, you know, does God reveal anything at all? But he's basically saying, if God does, the best revelation that he's found is Christianity, the one that makes the most sense, that actually has a historical foundation that is reasonable. And so, this leads to the conclusion that the most reasonable explanation for the bedrock historical facts is that Christ is risen. I'll just read to you a quote from Bishop Melito of Sardis. Bishop Melito of Sardis actually went to Christ's uh, tomb way back in the time of Uh, just after Emperor Hadrian had filled in the quarry and he made this temple, 
someone took him to this temple and showed him the uh, place where Christ had been uh, crucified and the place where Christ had risen or, or Christ had been buried. And uh, so Bishop Melito of Sardis actually, uh, he, he says, oh, well, it's inside the city. Why? Well, because that wall had already been built, the third wall. So his account actually matches the location very well. And, but he wrote in his Easter homily that Christ would say this, I am the Christ. I have destroyed death, triumphed over the enemy, trampled hell underfoot, bound the strong one, and taken men up to the heights of heaven. Come, all you nations of men, receive forgiveness for the sins that defile you. I am your forgiveness. I am the Passover that brings salvation. I am the lamb who was immolated for you. I am your ransom, your life, your resurrection, your light. I am your salvation and your king. I will bring you to the heights of heaven. With my own right hand, I will raise you up and I will show you the eternal father. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your revelation. And we ask you to help us to understand it, to be sincere and measured in our defense of the truth of your gospel, and help us to be authentic witnesses in humility, but with boldness of your resurrection and your life. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Thank you very much, Father Terry. I wonder if you might be able to give some questions. Sure. Father Terry, I'll reprise my role as devil's advocate. Um, the, I believe in the resurrection, obviously, but um, I don't know if the historical uh, case work is, is necessarily. Uh, all that strong. Uh, for instance, you have the five historical principles, the uh, multiple independent sources. Uh, the problem you have with with that is that you know, a lot of other sources talk about crucifixion, which I think is you know undoubted, but not very few of them talk about the resurrection or the end too. Uh, right. Yeah. To, say, to follow up with it right away is that um, one of the, the points that's made in this book is that there's a lot of things that we would like to have as a historian about the resurrection that we don't have. So one of them would be independent, non-biblical sources for the empty tomb or for uh, various other you know, accounts that, that we just don't have. So I agree with the, the first part of where you're going. And uh, the, um, I guess it's the same with, uh, uh, you know, eyewitness uh, testimony. Um, you know, I guess it's uh, similar there. But uh, also about your four facts is that Jesus was crucified and buried. I think there's, there's no doubt about that. And that the early Christians believed Jesus rose from the dead. It's, um, it's important that you put that in there because, of course, uh, there's no real evidence that he, that he did rise other than the answer. And I think that although the most likely explanation, I think, is that there probably was a resurrection, there are, there are other possibilities as well. So, for instance, um, you know, uh, early Christians or, or Christians through the ages were really interested in relics. And so they would, you know, and, and it could be a similar thing with Jesus, is that you might have some early devout Christians who might take the body sort of as a relic. Or you could have Jewish people who go in and desecrate the grave, and I think it boils down to what you said about you know that that, that it's um, easily and without strain is the quote that that um, but uh, to believe that the resurrection <coughs> is, but only if you acknowledge the supernatural. And That's true. I, I would agree that that if you deny 
beforehand, kind of, you know, the possibility of the supernatural, or if that is set as a so unlikely kind of a thing, then, then basically you would likely discount the resurrection as a possibility because it involves something supernatural, right? And so immediately you, you get into a state where you're looking for a poss the best possible natural explanation is really the only one that, that could make sense. Yes, so I agree that, that for someone who has, there's no uh, possibility of supernatural things happening in general, um, then their, their approach to this whole question uh, is kind of a, like a non-starter. It's not even possible to introduce that as a hypothesis because it's, it's filtered out. Yeah, so the first step for people would be what, what makes more sense, a reality that involves the supernatural or a reality that's inherently natural. And then you can move on to that. And I think if you acknowledge the supernatural, this is the most likely explanation. It's not necessarily the, the, word, the most likely explanation is not necessarily always going to be the true explanation. Most right. more times than not. Exactly, and I think that's an excellent point, which is uh, we need to actually do other work with a, the majority of non-believers to address the, is it reasonable to believe that the supernatural could happen? <laughs> and if, if we don't start there, um, then this isn't going to, it's not worth going and doing all this. <laughs> which, which goes back to your talk last year. Yeah, yeah, and there, there are other, other things that we need to do as a precursor to this. But for people who actually are open to the idea that there could be supernatural events, such as Antony Flew, for example, now he actually is a deist, and deists don't necessarily believe that there is a supernatural activity in the world. They believe that there's a god out there that started everything up and you know, may or may not interact with the world, but probably not. <laughs> so that's, that's where he is, but he still says, hey, this is a pretty strong argument, even though he doesn't accept it. So what it shows is that the closer a person gets to kind of uh, looking at revelation and the possibility of intervention in the world, either to reveal God revealing himself or, or performing miracles of some kind, then I think they're at the point where this kind of an argument has traction. And, and I think there are ways of addressing, and I encourage you to take a look at this, addressing some of the things you just raised about uh, relics being, or, or the body being taken in, in different ways, uh, sort, of, sort of later on, or, or something like this. Um, and, and I think that, that there is some, some weight to be placed on, uh, as well, the fact that you have these spectacular conversions, too. Because the conversion of Paul, you know, there, there's something very dramatic that's happening there, and, and it does tie into historical explanations, you know. So, so to, to see that, and there's a few other minimal facts that show up in this book that I didn't get into because they're kind of uh, nuanced. But uh, I'd be interested in, in getting your take on on some of the deeper elements of this book. James, you hear people sometimes talk about the garden tomb and that it is the true site of Christ's burial. Um, a lot of what you presented here goes to discount that. What is the history of the garden tomb and its claim as being the true tomb? Okay, so this is the kind of the, from what I understand, the garden tomb is the, the, the Protestant site, if you will, yeah. of, of the resurrection. Um, <laughs> I, I asked this question to, um, to Father Rick Jaworski, our resident scripture scholar, to see, well, what, you know, He's been to Jerusalem and, and so on. Um, and I don't, I don't remember all the details of what he said, so I don't, I don't want to say something too definitive here. Um, but from what I can tell, the, the choice of that site uh, has, has zero early church backing. Just none um, compared to what I just showed you, which I think is substantial. Uh, if not conclusive. Um, but it was a place where I, I think part of the reason why it was chosen was based on kind of the, how it looks 
from afar, like the silhouette of the whole thing looks like a skull, kind of a, kind of a thing um, in, in one location for you know, where they're proposing that that would be you know, maybe where Calvary was. And then the empty tomb location, I, I don't know the, uh, the basis upon, I mean, there, there are many sites in that area, you know, around Jerusalem, which could be, you know, there, there are tombs around there. So it's not like you can't find one that, that would be, hey, maybe this was the tomb, right? So beyond that, I don't know, does anyone else here have, have visited that location and have an answer for James? Yeah, it kind of goes beyond what I know. So I think it's a great question, but I don't have, I don't have more, more for you. Sorry about that. <laughs> I know in my little bit of reading about it, um, the fact that it sort of looks like a skull from afar and also that it's outside the city walls, the current city walls, not taking into account the fact that historically the walls have expanded and that, as you showed on your maps, um, at the time of the crucifixion, the site of Calvary, as it is held um, traditionally, is outside the city walls. Although some people look at it today and say, oh, that site is within the city walls. Yeah. Completely discounting the fact that the walls have expanded. So, I, I, yeah, and that's a good point, is that some people who, who don't know the details that I just showed you uh, look at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and just say, well, it can't be that, because <laughs> it's in the city. <laughs> Full stop, and they just have no clue as to all of the historical development of the city walls and the fact that there are three northern walls and you know all these other things uh, that have changed since then. Anyone else? Has anyone? Oh, okay, yeah. So, like, looking here, where would he have been condemned? This is a difficult question because there are multiple uh, proposed sites for the, I think it's called the Praetorium, which would have been the beginning of the Way of the Cross. Um, I happen to know from uh, a ser an archaeological series that uh, Father Scott McCaig is watching currently, because he's about to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. It's uh, called The Great Courses, the Holy Land. So it's this huge uh, series on everything about the Holy Land. That the current uh, way of the cross path is uh, dubious. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> there, there's no real evidence that the particular path that people will walk down and through, the traditional path, or one of the traditional paths, because it's changed over, over history, uh, is actually the path that Jesus uh, walked through. And one of the reasons why is because the location of the beginning of that, the Praetorium, there's, there's an alternate theory about where the beginning is. So I don't remember the locations of uh, where the Praetorium might have been. <laughs> but... Um, I think from, from what I had, the reading I had done was that, I guess, one piece of it probably would have been something along, going along the northern wall near the end to get to the garden gate. So the, the last piece of it was probably something like that. <laughs> I could say that. <laughs> because, uh, well, partly because it's hard to go through walls uh, here, <laughs> but also because of... Uh, the, uh, the past that, that exists in that, in that region. But there could have been, um, I don't remember where the, the likely site of the Praetorium was at the beginning. And the difficulty was with, you know, having a, 
keeping the whole way of the cross uh, intact, like we know exactly where it was or something, the difficulty with keeping that uh, clear is there was a very large uh, economic benefit to having the way of the cross go by your shop. <laughs> I mean, just think about that. That's a huge <laughs> boost, right? So you can imagine how the, the, the path could easily change based on economic motive and so on. Uh, and it's not something that had a, a kind of solid historical marker early, early on. Sure, there later on there are certain sites that were traditionally based on one of the paths that, that happened, but, but there was no early, early walking of the way of the cross like there was early, early visitation to the place uh, to celebrate liturgies at the location of the, the death of Christ and, and the tomb. Yep. Um, might be a little uh, going off topic a bit, but what kind of uh, like historical backing and significance can there be found, uh, if any, for St. Helen finding the you know, true cross of Christ in the 4th century or whatever? Well, and, uh, in, does that help the resurrection or death of Jesus at all? It, it really doesn't play into the evidence for the resurrection. I think it does play into, you know, <laughs> If you believe that, that the, the Holy Sepulcher is you know, the authentic site, then at least gives you the possibility that Hel St. Helen found, found something connected to Calvary. Because you know, in the same Church of the Holy Sepulcher, there are areas that are attributed to that kind of digging and searching you know, for the relics of the true cross. So uh, I would say that um, you know, the historical evidence for the finding of the relics is less certain. It must be less certain than the, the historical evidence for this being the right location, right? Because if this isn't the right location, there's zero chance that St. Helen really found the relic of the true cross. I, I, I think that's definite. So, so you have to kind of take the the, the, the probability of one multiplied by the probability of the second. And it, it's, it's hard to summarize the evidence for the, the accounts of, of St. Helen's. Uh, it's mostly from St. John Chrysostom's writings, from what I understand. So, you know, part of it is how accurate uh, an account is St. John Chrysostom providing, and how far away was that account from the actual events. And, you know, so then you... you that's what you begin to, to narrow in on historically. Yeah, just to let people know, the whole of our minds are the base of valleys, because Jerusalem is a very heavy base. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you ever sit there, the hills are very steep all the time. So this is why the temple is the valley. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's oh, the, called the Temple Mount, right? Very, yeah. Well, yeah, so you end up with people, uh, I guess they, they would often have things on the, the roofs of their houses as well, from what I understand. That, that was kind of like another room of the house, and you could kind of see other people on other roofs up higher on the, the hills and down lower. Yeah. Well, Jerry, thank you very much. You're welcome.
uh, we do run the nine month program here that the students are involved in, as well as a nine day program that any adult can come to. And we have a couple other conferences throughout the year that anyone can attend. Um, we also have a couple projects that we are currently fundraising for. One is for a 42 passenger bus that we will find at a very good price at auction. And this helps us um, just transfer program participants uh, from the city out to here, take the students on um, our pilgrimage to Waka to celebrate St. Terence Feast Day and any other events. So um, if you have any questions about that or want to support that, that would be great. And also we're fundraising for uh, finally after five years, a multifunctional and actual functional photocopier, first of all. <laughs>